Welcome to this episode of The Aquarist Sedge, a podcast for home aquarists just like you. Learn more about how to keep a thriving aquarium and discover ideas and tips to give your aquarium the edge. And now, over to our host, Arthur Preston. Have you ever wondered what makes your fish tick? What makes them a fish? In this episode, we're going to look at the biological roots of fish behavior. We take a quick glance at their cognitive capacities, their social dynamics and how their environment, including your aquarium, shapes their actions. We're going to look at fish emotions, problem solving abilities and some case studies. And yes, we're going to talk about that goldfish that learned to drive its own tank. So whether you're a beginner with a better in a bowl or a seasoned tank pro, this episode is going to transform the way that you see your fish. We're also going to, to look at some less commonly discussed behaviors such as predator mimicry, parental care strategies, and cross-species cooperation. Yep, even in aquariums, some fish work together in fascinating ways. We're also going to explore sensory perception in fish, how they see, hear, and smell, and what that tells us about their world. So let's begin our behavioral journey. We need to go back, way back, yet yeah, even further back than that. Fish have existed for over 500 million years, and their behaviors today are shaped by eons of evolution, adapting them to a multitude of diverse environments. From fast moving rivers, to silent blackwater forests and coral reefs teeming with life. Let's break this down by habitat and the adaptive behaviors. Pelagic fish like sardines and danios evolved to school for protection with tight synchronous movement that confuses predators. Then there are fish that we call benthic, like gobies or plecos. They developed camouflage and various strategies for ambush. Then we have our reef dwellers, such as clownfish or damsels. These have evolved vivid coloration and complex social behaviors for densely populated environments. Some of the behavioral drivers, things that cause fish to act the way they do, include such things as territoriality, that's common in environments with limited space or resources, schooling and shoaling, which are protective strategies against predation, color changes, color communicates status or mood or even a readiness to breed, mimicry and camouflage, which is seen in marine species such as wrasses and scorpion fish, and of course, burrowing or substrate interaction, that's used for shelter or feeding or breeding. For example, in Lake Tanganyika, um, certain cichlids, the uh, Neolum prologus cichlids, engage in cooperative breeding. The offspring help the parents defend and clean the nest, very similar to what you might see in meerkats. So, when you have your tank, it's great to try and understand the evolutionary niche that your species come fr comes from, because it will help you design better tanks, reduce stress, and possibly most importantly, promote natural behavior. So, <laughs> let's bust a myth right here. You know, you've heard those stories about goldfish being able to swim round and round in a bowl because they have a short-term memory. Firstly, don't put your goldfish in a bowl. Secondly, fish do not have a three-second memory. In actual fact, fish demonstrate complex learning and memory abilities. There was a standout study that came from Ben Gurion University in Israel. Researchers placed goldfish in a tank mounted on wheels, controlled by a camera tracking the fish's position. When the goldfish swam toward a specific direction, the robotic platform moved accordingly, and so the goal was to navigate to a target marker to receive food. The outcome of this experiment was that the goldfish learned to steer their tanks across a room, and they even adjusted their, their movement for obstacles. What this showed is that goldfish actually have spatial memory. They show associative learning and visual target recognition. So much for the goldfish being dumb. There are other research studies that show that fish can be trained to swim through mazes, that guppies can count up to four, that oscars play with floating toys, and that better fish can distinguish between different humans. Fish have something called a telencephalon, which is a brain region similar to the hippocampus of mammals, and that's involved in learning and emotion. They're not just mindless creatures swimming around in water in your tank. How do you tap into this? Well, you can use food-based training. You can gently tap on the tank when feeding, and over time, the fish will associate that movement 
or that action with mealtime. You would have seen this. If you feed your tank at the same time on a regular basis, if they're used to seeing you, they will naturally come towards the tank, even if you just place your finger there. It's not just curiosity. They are learning to associate you with food time. You can observe problem solving, introduce feeding puzzles or floating rings. To understand fish behavior, you need to understand how they perceive the world. So let's start with their vision. Most fish can see in full color and many even perceive ultraviolet light. Nocturnal fish have larger pupils and they have rods in their eyes to detect contrast, while some species detect polarized light, which gives them the edge in murky water. They also have something which you may have heard of called the lateral line system. And this is a sensory organ that runs along the side of their bodies that detects vibration and the movement of water. And this is crucial for detecting predators and maintaining schooling formations. They also have smell. They use smell to find mates, to detect predators, and to identify members of their school. You'll know that salmon, for example, famously return to their natal streams using smelling cues, or what we call olfactory cues. Some fish, like elephant nose or knife fish, use electric fields, called electroreception, to detect objects and, and their prey in dark or muddy waters. Now, if you want to watch your fish at night, a good idea is to use um, red lighting because many fish can't detect red wavelengths. And if you, so if you want to see your bristlenose plecos feeding or, or other fish that only come out at night, pop a red light over your tank and you'll be amazed at what you can see. Another thing to avoid is storing chemical contaminants in your tanks. Apart from the obvious risk of them falling in, um, there's also the smell that comes from them. And we know the fish smell more than we realize. Let's have a look at a couple of species that are common in um, home aquarist tanks and see what kind of behaviors these fish are exhibiting and what they might mean. And let's start with one that many of us have kept before and that I may currently have, and that is a better. We know that the territorial males will flare their gill covers to intimidate others. They will build bubble nests, which is a sign of readiness to breed. And believe it or not, they can be trained to jump for food or to follow fingers. Better are considered to be particularly intelligent fish. Then we have our African cichlids. These fish engage in ritualized combat. They can do lip locking. They can show intense color changes based on hierarchy. And the males court the females by dancing and fanning their fins. Some of my favorite fish are the corridoras. These are social showlers and they often mimic each other's behavior. You'll see that they will wiggle when excited or preparing to spawn. And interestingly, they sleep in synchronized clusters it's quite sweet, actually. Then you have the garamis. These are also labyrinth fish, like your betas. They use a labyrinth organ to gulp air from the surface, and the males will also build bubble nests and they'll guard the eggs. Garami show cautious and deliberate movements, and they bond very closely with their mates. Another one that's become increasingly popular in home tanks these days is pufferfish. These are intelligent animals and are easily bored. It has been shown that pufferfish can recognize human faces and they will use tools to access food. Does that make you look at your tank a bit differently? I hope it does. Because again, I go back to what I often say on this podcast, spend time watching your tank. Sit at your aquarium. Watch the fish's behavior. See how they're interacting with their environment and with each other. You'll be amazed at what you can see when you take the time to simply watch and observe little tip here is provide enrichment in your tank. Floating leaves, caves, toys for active species. Change them around fairly frequently. Change the environment a bit. Uh, give them something that is different. Otherwise, it's the same old, same old, and you may not get as natural behavior as you might like. Also, for schooling species, such as your corridoras or tetras, um, keep them in groups of six or more. You'll get the best out of them that way. What about aggression? You know, people often talk about aggression in their tanks with certain species, but many fish will, at some point, um, demonstrate some form of aggression. It's a normal and often necessary part of social systems within the fish world. But of course, unmanaged, it can cause injury, stress, and even death. What causes a fish to become aggressive? It could be a couple of things. It could be defensive territory. It could be competition for mates. 
It could be a lack of environmental structure or even improper stocking ratios that you haven't quite got the community mix right in your tank. It's also a hierarchy in action. Um, you know, often, for example, your door cichlids, they form harems or pair bonds with strong male dominance. So how do you manage this? Well, you could rearrange the decor before introducing new fish. You could use dither fish like Danios to diffuse the tension in your tank. And break up line of sight. Use plants and other forms of, of aquarium decor so that the fish can hide behind something and they're not always seeing many other fish around them. So when you're watching your tank, check for things like flaring but not biting. This could just be a display. It could be something that they're just showing off, um, either show their size, to impress a mate, um, or to claim territory. However, if you see that fins are torn or there's scales missing off the side of a fish, it may be that one or two of your fish are becoming particularly aggressive with their tank mates, and that might mean you need to separate the fish. Behaviour is often an indicator of health and disease. And behaviour changes can often occur before physical symptoms, and you need to learn to spot them early. Some of the red flags that you'll see are scratching or flashing, and that could indicate parasites such as ick. You might find that your fish are very lethargic and that may signal poor water quality or an internal illness. If they lose their appetite, it's often a first sign of trouble, and if they swim erratically, it could indicate a neurological issue, stress or toxins in the water. So, it's a good idea to know what to expect for each species. Again, do your research, know what to expect. That behavioural baseline is important. Know what's normal so that you'll also know when something is not. Now let's also remember that fish don't just need clean water and healthy food. They also need stimulation. And I mentioned a couple of ideas a few minutes ago, but let's go back through it again. Ideas to enrich your tank. You could rotate the decor every few weeks. You could bury some treats. You could use floating rings. Um, you could have live food chases. You pop some Daphne in the tank or brine shrimp and watch the, the animals actually, the fish actually chase over those animals to, to grab them for a light snack. You could use mirrors for a short period of time with betas or garamis just to create some stimulation in the tank. Don't leave them in the tank, but have them there for a short bit. And um, maybe some interactive toys, you know, small things that can be pushed around, particularly with fish like puffers, they love to do that. Um, you could use tunnels, caves, um, it could be lots of different things. Add leaves, add botanicals into your tank. Create some environmental enrichment to make your tank a bit different. A couple of things to know and, and maybe some interesting things that you didn't know about certain species. Oscars have been known to play with ping pong balls. Uh, and it's not feeding, they're not trying to eat the ping pong balls, it's enrichment, they're actually playing. Discus will exhibit intentional parenting because both parents will secrete mucus for their fry to eat. Guppies have also been known to perform selecting mating dances. They will choose a certain type of dance for a particular female and it will only be to that female that they will behave in that particular way. Very interesting. You might find that your live bearers, or any fish for that matter, they circle in formation before every feeding. If they go to one side of the tank, that's because you probably feed from that side. And they've learned that when they go to the left-hand side of the tank, that is where the food goes. And they'll go there each time you come past the tank, hoping that you're going to drop some lovely snacks into the tank for them. When you are observing your tank and becoming a student of your fish, watch at different times of the day. Do the fish act differently in the mornings, in the afternoons, in the evenings, when the lights are off, at feeding time. Press if you really want to take this seriously, you could journal, you could write down your weekly or daily observations, and uh, possibly even pop up a webcam to see your fish if you really want to see what's going on when you're not around. And over time, you will see patterns emerge. And that way you'll be able to catch subtle changes before they become problems. Now, I understand that not everybody is going to go that far. Not everybody's going to have a, a journal in which they write down everything they see in their tank. But if fish behavior is something that really fascinates you, you will find value in this. And, and quite honestly, it won't necessarily make you a better aquarist, but it'll certainly make you a more aware aquarist in terms of knowing what to look for, what to see, and to find the unexpected um, in the behavior of your fish. So let's close this by saying that fish behavior, it's not just fascinating, it's essential. By watching closely, learning continuously, 
and caring deeply about the well-being of the animals that we care for, we build better aquariums and deeper relationships with our aquatic pets. I have to say that when I talk to some people, some friends of mine or colleagues, and I, I talk about having fish as pets, they look at me a bit strange because people who don't know fish can't imagine that you can build a connection with an aquatic animal, besides maybe a dolphin, um, which of course is not a fish. So it's difficult, but I think if you are somebody who has invested time and energy in learning about the animals in your care, if you find fish behavior fascinating, spend time with them, build a relationship with them, Understand that behavior is communication, cognition in fish is real, and that observation is your most powerful tool. Thank you for spending this bit of time on the Acquis Edge podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe or leave a review and share it with others. And don't forget to keep learning, keep discovering, and keep enjoying this amazing hobby. Take care. Bye for now. That's it for this episode of The Aquarius Sedge. Please consider subscribing to this podcast so that you don't miss further episodes. We would love it if you would also rate and review the podcast as this helps make it visible to others. Until next time, keep learning and discovering and keep finding your Aquarius Sedge in this captivating and fascinating hobby.